Hello, everybody, and welcome to part two of the uh, West Coast Offshore Sailing Seminar Series. This is a three-part series. This is our middle third. Uh, we're going to give everybody just a couple of seconds to kind of filter on in here. Um, for those of you who are joining, we can't thank you enough for spending cocktail hour with us. Um, we're going to start. Uh, I'm joined by uh, some of the greatest offshore guys here in Southern California. Uh, Brian Janey, who's based out of San Diego. Brian, are you there? Is your internet working? Yep. How you doing? And uh, we got the, the catamaran, the trimaran king himself, Patrick Murray. Patrick, are you uh, online? We're here. I'm live. And then the, uh, the OG Santa Cruz 70 <laughs> legend uh, himself, Bill Hershaft out of L.A. Bill, does the Internet still work up there in L.A.? Yeah, it does. There's, you know, coffee cans and strings tied together, but it works. Cool, cool. Well, guys, thanks <laughs> for joining me and we have a great program here tonight we're gonna recap uh, the two offshore races that we just had um, and then we will uh, talk a little bit about Transpac uh, for those of you guys who are interested in what part three is going to be about it's going to be some uh, Ensenada recap and last second Transpac stuff so this will kind of cover the introduction to Transpac and then there will be one more after this so Let's start with the Islands race. It was hosted by Newport Harbor Yacht Club and San Diego Yacht Club. We started uh, off Angels Gate in uh, the Port of L.A. Um, so, you know, the, we, we spent a lot of time in the other seminar talking about the first leg of the race and kind of breaking it into three parts. I sailed on the J-111, the Picosa. We started the race. We had a great start. And all of a sudden, we see this catamaran just trucking along and there's Patrick just laughing at me, getting ready to roll us. And it uh, looks like you guys were first or second to the West End. Trick, talk to us a little bit about your beat to Catalina and overall your Islands race experience. Yeah, thanks Alex. It was, uh, it was really a perfect day for racing. So it was really cool to see all the boats out sailing. It was like absolutely champagne conditions, blue sky. As you can see by the tracks here in the beginning, we just had a nice west wind and it was like west northwest. And uh, I remember seeing the wind direction, true wind direction, right around 270, which uh, set us up essentially to everybody lay. I did hear a few tacking boats that had to tack to get around Catalina, but um, we had a great beat on the Chim Chim. I was on the gunboat 62. We we were uh, really working on our upwind performance and we had a nice little beat where we were able to go uh, pretty high and tight to the wind and, and keep our pace on really not until literally we were rounding the West end. Piwacket was, you know, charging up to us. We knew we were trying to get it in front of them as best we could, but they were going really well. So we, uh, we got there right basically simultaneously. And then they were able to get through our lead and just kind of take off and go from there, but it was beautiful setup. It was a straight shot. So it was really not that much, you know, in it, in terms of tactics, but just trying to get as uh, fast forward as you could. We we're actually able, you can kind of see in the tracks right here, everybody was keeping their bow up until the point, you know, where you really knew you were easily laying the West end. And then you start cracking sheets to kind of start going a little faster to get around. Yeah. It was somewhere right in here. And a lot of yeah. it, I remember it was all moting, right? Like, especially us small guys in the front, you know, we're constantly looking back, trying to figure out where the big boats are coming, how do we position ourselves and encouraging them to sail the leeward of us rather than kind of march over the top. So, um, you know, from there to San Clemente, it was relatively straightforward. Um, and then, you know, we, we got around San Clemente and there's a lot of different ways to play this thing. I know that uh, our boat, we played it dead wrong because I watched first place sail by us about uh, five miles to leeward of us. But the Chim Chim, you guys, uh, you guys made a little interesting move here just after St. Clemente Island. Talk to us about the, ge the, the geometry of the island and how it affects the wind and kind of what you're looking for to set yourself up coming into San Diego. Well, yeah, it's always, it's tricky because you get to, well, as you saw, they had two exclusion marks that were virtual marks pretty far off the island from uh, military activity. And so they kept us well out of there. And so when you approach the mark, it's really tempting because you're not making really good kind of headway or VMG back to San Diego. So you really kind of feel like you want to start heading that way. 
but there's a pretty big lee that comes off, you know, and, and just essentially bad air off the island. So if you go too early and you get kind of sucked up, you can see all these tracks really start kind of turning up to the north as you get under the island. So it, the one that really stands out to my mind is uh, Fast Exit down here sailed, you know, pretty far away from the mark, maybe did a sail change from like a reaching sail to a running sail. So they, you know, started sailing lower mode. But that that that's a hard course to sail because you're really not making much VMG back towards San Diego. But in the end, they were able to, you know, like you show on that arrow, really start pointing more directly towards San Diego. On the Chim Chim, we sail wide angles, so it's kind of tough compared to the monohulls. But we we were having to, we started, you can see we on our track, we start getting lifted up into that bad air. And it's time to start getting south to uh, transit the bad air in a narrower spot and in, you know, where you're going to have more good air approaching San Diego, uh, which is a long way away still from here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, this was my first time doing the race. It's hard to kind of swallow the pill and go a little bit extra to, you know, to figure out where you're going to be in seven hours from now. That's huge. And the, the island is sneaky wide. So that was something that I definitely learned and, you know, how the mountains kind of affect the breeze. And it was pretty amazing to me. Um, you know, Brian, this is our, our transition now. Uh, you know, Brian smashed, uh, I think the island's record as well. Uh, that kind of got swept under the rug by this amazing accomplishment that you guys had during the Cabo race. It looked like it was going to be a, a, an 800 mile match race for a long time between you guys and the Rio and you guys were able to dodge the whale and off you went. So tell us a little bit about your guys' uh, experience in this. Yeah, I mean, about a week out, we knew it was going to be good weather with a cold front coming through. So we are all of our routing was pretty much saying it was going to be close to the record. It wasn't until a few days before it was looking pretty confident on an actual record run. Um, the whole way down, we were thinking we had to play with Rio 100. It's still a hundred footer. And, uh, we were going to basically stay in touch with them the whole time. And we wanted to stay offshore of them. Um, just to show how good the wind was, the Artemis there, which is a Botine 56, they also broke the magnitude 80 record, uh, I think by about half hour. And that's just a standard sailboat. Um, I think the whole fleet was in in three days. It's a pretty quick race. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is your guys' track. You guys, you know, I don't know where you are. You're past Ensenada. You're going straight. Talk to us a little bit about just kind of the first day. And it sounds like a lot of people, including, you know, my, my guys, the compadres, they had a pretty wild first night. Talk to us a little bit about the, that kind of first day of the race. Yeah, pretty much all the models were agreeing the wind was going to fill in around 4 p.m. sunset, and it did, around 15, 16 knots. And like in this picture, you can see we're just getting past San Diego. And then uh, we went from base, oh, pretty much sailing like a fast upwind mode to starting to reach. And then I think just after sunset, we got into our A3 and really started moving. Yeah. And it was about that time Rio had uh, – they don't know what they hit. They think it was a shark or something like that. And they, they damaged their uh, steering quadrant or something with a rudder. So they had to uh, withdraw. Yeah. And so the, you guys went really far on starboard. What was sort of that realization for you guys to jive? Obviously on the track, it looks like you might've gotten lifted. You know, what point of the day is it going on? What's the conversation in the boat to, to get it going? And why only the one jive? Well, we were going to jive in to stay closer to Rio and kind of push them closer to shore. But when they ended up withdrawing, we were just like decided to limit maneuvers. And they're so difficult with the sails, each weighing about 200 pounds, that when they get wet, they weigh even more. And moving the stack size side takes forever. So we decided go straight. We were hoping to jive around sunrise. But as you can see, by the track would start getting lifted. So we had to jive. I think it was around four or five in the morning. And uh, then from there, it was pretty much a straight line run almost all the way down. We did a few jives closer to the Cabo as it got lighter, but um, it was almost a one and in for a majority of the race. That's got to be a good feeling. 
And uh, here's a picture, you guys. This looks like super mellow sailing, kind of like when I sailed my Harbor 20 or something like that. <laughs> yeah, good. everybody's asking what's it like on the race. Um, you know, it wasn't like outrageously fast speeds, were, but our average was really high and consistent. We averaged around 20 knots for the race. Um, these Volvo 70s, you've probably seen videos, they're wet, and there I am going forward to go off watch, and you really got to watch out for that. <laughs> taking one right to the face. Um, it's just a lot of water across the deck. Uh, we try to get the weight aft just like a dinghy or anything. And uh, just move all sails back, everything we can aft just to keep the bow out, keep it ripping. Well, it looks like you guys are certainly ripping. And I was not going this fast in my etchels today. I'll, I'll tell you that. Uh, we, we were in max displacement mode. So. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, moving on here. So let's talk a little bit about Transpac. Uh, Billy, did you, is it true? Did you do the first ever Transpac or how many of these things have you done? Well, yeah, I'm pretty old, but not quite the first one. Um, I've done, I've only done five really, but the first one I did was way back in 1981. It was on a Santa Cruz 50. And at the time the, was the Santa Cruz 70 was just a piece of drawing on a piece of paper by Bill Lee. So we had quite a few Santa Cruz 50s. Then in the 90s, in the heyday of the sleds, I did three on Santa Cruz 70s. And then the most recent was a uh, Transpac 52, which certainly isn't as good as a Santa Cruz 70. So yeah, yeah, I've done a few. So uh, give us you know, kind of the, the first point uh, of on the race is getting around the West end and kind of getting into the trade. What, what are kind of your rules of thumb to getting to that West end? And then from there trying to get into that next uh, transition part of the race. Well, typically in big, broad general terms, you start the race in light air. So you'll start with a, with a probably your full size Genoa up. Um, you might take a tack to clear your air. But then you want to take one straight shot to Catalina and if you lay the west end. That's great. If not, you'll hit the you'll hit Catalina and short tack up the face. Uh, when as you get to Catalina, the wind will increase and you might shift down to a number three jib. Uh, after the west end, you might even reef, depending on uh, where your navigator wants you to go. It's uh, it is called the navigator's race. So when you get past the west end. The navigator is going to project two or three days down the road, and he's going to predict where the high pressure is. He's going to find a spot uh, where he wants the boat to be. The reason is the high pressure, the Great Circle route has the least amount of miles sailed, but you run into the high pressure and light air. So he, he wants to find the optimum spot three or four days down the road where he wants to, the boat so you don't sail too many miles south, but you sail fewer miles and still have good breeze. Yeah, and that's kind of the stand, honey. That's called the slot cars, right? Yeah, correct. You slot in. You, after the West End, you might, depending on where his waypoint is, you might even be beating or what I call power beating. So you want to ease the jib sheet a little, drop the traveler and hunker down for a day or two until the wind starts moving aft. Then the, the middle third, once the wind goes way off, actually Patrick's gonna talk about sail selection later. So I'll just kind of talk about the slot. So the middle part, you're pretty much VMG running. You're in the trade winds. It's, you know, blue sky, puffy white clouds. You will encounter squalls. And depending on where what you're running, depending on where you wanna be in terms of your fleet and your competitors, if a squall comes and it's big enough, and the wind shifts enough, you might jibe to try to get your bow in front of your, your competitors. So there is the trick of playing squalls. You might just run straight through them. Uh, you might even jibe them, but that's all. That's up to the navigator and up to the tactician. Yeah, I've heard it. Whenever you can point in, in that sort of middle section, whenever you can just point at Hawaii, you're winning. So that, that was yeah. what uh, I heard. Correct. You can see kind of the S curve through all this. Uh, the wind, the last third of the race, the wind will continue to go east. You'll probably spend some time on, on uh, starboard jibe. You, will, you don't put a waypoint directly at Oahu. You um, tend to go put a waypoint off 
Kalapapa Lighthouse on Molokai. You aim for that. You, you'll probably hit Molokai somewhere along the face, uh, sail down the face of Molokai, and then at the, at the lighthouse, you'll jibe. And that's usually a pretty fast angle to uh, Diamond Head. Uh, big waves, big breeze, typically. You always hear about the Molokai Channel, and it lives up to its name, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, and so here's some just sort of general rules of thumb. You know, Brian Janey always preaches it. Uh, uh, smooth is fast and fast is smooth. Or what is, it, what is the saying? Uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely a big thing on a long distance race. And, um, you know, you better do things methodically once and then, then frantically twice. I think that that's, that goes without saying in a lot of, even in your dinghy, dinghy racing, course racing, point to point, that's just definitely, uh, true. Uh, oh. true. Ch Ch One more thing. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Sorry. Oh, sorry. It just a couple points. Uh, Transpac is all about preparation and there's rules specific to the race. There's, uh, you got to prepare the boat, the gear, the sails, and the hard work you do in the beginning with preparation makes sailing part easy. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you don't, definitely don't want stuff breaking and being un, underprepared. And we'll get to that sort of sail kits and stuff a little later on. Trick, what what are we looking at here? We feel like I'm back in my high school statistics class. What, what talk to us a little bit about this table and how people can make something like this for their own boat and use it, you know, kind of for the race. You're on mute, Trick. So I apologize. This is um, the percentages of the race that you're gonna spend at particular wind angles or true wind angles, you know, and wind speeds. So you can see that the majority of the race is roughly, you know, uh, 18, 15 to 18 knots downwind 150 so whatever your boat's going to sail when you're sailing vmg downwind and that's what you really kind of hear about and that's what the brochure shows and you got the lay on you're making your way to honolulu and everything but i think it's really important to know that in order to get to that portion just like billy was saying that beginning part of the race where you're starting to do the reaching in this kind of you know 60 through 90 true is really important and your sales selection on how to manage that is, is really, really important because it, you know, the, the old timers kind of talk about the fright night on the first night and it's windy and, you know, you're going up wind, it's not comfortable. Um, it's, you know, it's rough and it can be really rough. So that can be essentially, like Billy said, I call it offshore upwind, just crack sheets. So you're going upwind, but you're trying to really keep the pace up. But then it's really critical to figure out how you're getting to that you know, running mode, which is depending on what boat you're on, it's two or three days down the road. You know, are you going through blast reachers and stasels? Are you going through jib tops? Are you going through code zeros? And what, what are your reaching, uh, you know, combinations that work? And I find it really important to sail your boat a lot in those configurations so that, you know, in the middle of the sail selection chart, go to the, go to the, setups that work really well sail the boat at that and wait for it be to become obvious to change to the next one because it's really easy to start sailing the boat outside of what it's kind of wanting to do and you're not sailing really well to your polars and you're not sailing that fast versus just keeping it on where it's going well and let it tell you that you need to go to the a3 you know typically this race is beautiful in the way you go from a jib some kind of reaching configuration to a little wider reaching configuration. And then, you know, once you're off and running, you're going downwind, it, it, it's pretty clear that you're just running from that point on. But that first two, three days and finding out where you want to be, like Billy said, is really critical. So, you know, finding what those combinations are on the boat, how you're going to use them, and, and really knowing what those sail sets are. Staysels come into play there. Genoa staysail inside all the reaching sails, and then you start putting up the running sails, and the spinnaker staysail goes up and lives up the rest of the race. Yeah, okay. cool, and that's a great breakdown. And you can get that. How can you get a chart like this for your boat? Well, you know, most of the guys like Artie Means, and you know, he's helped us. Peter Eisler, all these guys, they work really hard on this, so that you kind of have statistical data to work off of to make good decisions. And then obviously at the end, you're gonna have to, you know, watch the forecast and take the right sales that you have, um, you know, in your quiver 
and, and make sure that you're ready to know how to use them, set them up right. Because those first two, three days, like I said, it's not fun. And you got to know how to get out the, on the bow and set up a double head rig and you're smashing into waves and it's, it's the real deal. So, you know, I've learned to respect the Transpac race as one of the greatest races on the planet. And I, I, I really truly believe that it is that, and it deserves that amount of respect. So, yeah, I mean, imagine going to the bow in a situation like this, that doesn't look very fun. You know, it's almost as crazy as, uh, as you know, the Volvo 70 trick, take us down the Molokai channel. This is a, a, you got, you work with these guys, you help them with their sale optimization. This is the J125. I think it's the Snoopy. Yep. Um, you know, talk about that last sort of bit to the Island. Yeah, it's awesome. It's so cool. And depending on what time of day you're approaching and how you come up, like Billy said, you usually, you know, like I had one, I think the last time we were on the Swan 60 and you approach the islands and the islands just kind of grow up out of the ocean and you see Kalapapa and, and uh, Molokai just kind of show up and it's just, it's beautiful. We were there right at sunrise and, you know, you, it, it can be pretty entertaining because it's getting really windy and the breeze is compressing into the Molokai channel. And then you try and push it as feel as, as far as you feel comfortable to the Kalapapa lighthouse. And you're kind of like right on the beach, there's a lee shore right in front of you and you got to jibe, but then you, you kind of jibe there. And then you, you try and sail as, as low as you can to get through the channel, obviously you still sail your polars, but, and then if you can just stick your nose uh, under Makapu point on, as you're approaching Oahu, usually start getting headed and that's when you know Sharon Green and the helicopter and all the stuff start coming in and it's just windy and if you can get there you actually start getting headed so you had like a running sail on and now you're like making the approach to Diamond Head you see Cocoa Head and then you start coming towards Diamond Head and it just gets tighter and sometimes puffy and windy and you're just like the last five miles and it's this is exactly where they are I think approaching and you know it's just a it's it's like nothing you've ever done in sailing so it's so cool you're ripping right in and you're you're basically done after crossing you know 2500 or 2000 miles it's pretty amazing yeah my ties are dropping from the sky you got lay <laughs> everywhere it's, i mean you, you're seeing stars at that point so you know let's talk a little bit about sail prep um you know Brian what's the deal with these new rules man we're i know we're saving the whales we're not dropping yarn in the water what, what's the deal with these new rules they're just trying to remove trash so with rubber bands or yarn going in the water from spinnakers they're getting away from that and put that back in the rules that you're not allowed to do that kind of thing so we've had for the last i don't know how many years a zipper system for spinnakers where it basically is like banding the sail closes it up and uh allows you to hoist it very easy. In fact, I think the zippers are actually faster to do than doing yarn on the boat. Um, the big keys are in the first and middle picture are splitting the top and splitting the bottom to make sure the zipper opens up. Yeah, and here's a, a great video. This is you and Pike. This is a homemade uh, movie here, North Sales Production Media. Then <laughs> this is an example of how the zippers work um let's and you know so you go you hoist i've seen this in person and magically the sail goes from a very compressed tight area to pop and it's like if you sail a asymmetric boat or some hatch on a small or a, you're hoisting out of a hatch on a smaller boat the sail literally just goes pop when it's done and you the boat just lifts out of the water and kind of off you go so this is definitely the best, most efficient way of doing it. I know Pike is super experienced. He did five kites for the It's Okay guys last week. Um, we've done a bunch for my guys on the Compadres, you know, the Volvos. Uh, we've done it for Billy's guys on the Grand Illusion. So, you know, we're very experienced with this and it's something that we think that if you're serious about doing offshore racing, it's great. Um, so we got a good question from Lex Brand. Any racing downwind sales with Helix furling, or is that cruising only? Um, Bill, why don't you talk about that? Uh, you know, the difference between having a Helix furled sail versus the zippers. Well, the Helix furled sail is probably meant for a tighter reaching type sail. 
Uh, but we are using Helix technology in most of our, our sales. Um, the, the zippers typically come into play on a 2A and maybe even a, a 3A. Um, and any uh, tighter like Code Zero type sale or, or Jenniker would use the Helix uh, system. Yeah. And uh, we just, we just, in a 4A, well, no, you wouldn't. You do the zipper on the 4A as well. For sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, one note on the zippers, guys, is just especially like if you see in this uh, video right here, you can see how tightly uh, essentially banded, you know, it is when it's before when it's packed. It makes it way easier to, you know, as we say, ring the bell, get the sail all the way up to the top of the mast without the windage of even a, a banded sail. So not only is it easier to pack, but I think it, it makes it way easier to get the sail all the way up. I mean, how many times offshore you're a little short handed, you don't have the full crew sail goes up and it fills and you have like 12 feet of higher to do, you got to grind all the way up. Just, you know, it, it kills somebody to grind it all the way up. So having this to get it all the way to the top and you can pre-feed the tack on sprit boats out to the sprit and kind of walk away from it and, and leave it, which is uh, pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah, these are great. So um, that kind of brings us to our la last uh, sort of a deal. You know, Bill, you, you, you're you always in, in our shop in Long Beach, you're, you're talking, we got to get some sale repair kits going. <laughs> Guys, talk about what's in a sale repair kit and how important it is to have it. Yeah, sale repair kits are really important. And you need to, if you tear a sale, you need to fix it. And Anything, Murphy's Law, anything that could go wrong will go wrong. And that's how you plan for it. Now, a typical sale repair kit will have a good pair of shears, good pair of sharp scissors, because these new materials are hard to cut. Uh, you need a good hand sewing kit, a seam ripper in case you have to take tapes off of a spinnaker, a good ceramic knife to cut high-tech webbing. Um, what I, in the old days, we would take tons of insignia material and I use that a lot but now with this Cuban PSA Cuban fiber material PSA is pressure sensitive adhesive it has probably the stickiest adhesive I've seen so it's really thin uh, unidirectional fibers laminated and has a great uh, adhesive to it so you can use that almost on almost anything uh, so you should invest in a four or six, six inch roll, nice roll of Cuban fiber. Um, three inch Dacron Insignia tape, use that a lot. You should bring some Spectre webbing in case you have to like hand sew or lash a ring back to a sail. Um, I, I use a lot of the half inch seam tape. Seam tape is a double sided sticky tape. And if I have a spinnaker repair, I'll lay it out, have someone help me. I would cut little strips of of seam tape and literally suture first the, the tear. Then I would cut out a piece of material, spinnaker material, whatever. Align that with the seam stick tape, stick that down, and then you're ready to go. That sail is, is now prepared. And it looks smooth going up if you suture it properly in the first place and stick it down nicely. It's good to have a bunch of sail ties. With these new zipper systems, you need a lot of extra zipper cars. Um, some people actually take spare battens, uh, boats that are just jib only with battens. You, know, you tromp on them down below, you tromp on the sails, you could break a batten. So you might want to bring some spare battens. Stainless steel rings are good. In case you rip a ring out of your main, you can hand sew a, a stainless ring back together, back on the sail. So those are the basics. There's some other stuff you might consider. Um, is there another slide for that? Yeah, but those oh, are the basics oh. and you do well by carrying a kit like that. And you can get all that stuff from us, just to order it um, from us well in advance. So that way we can put the kit together for you and bring it to you. Um, and, you know, that kind of brings us to the end. Guys, any last, uh, any last words, Brian, Patrick? Yeah, I, I got one real quick back to the sail repair kit. Actually, if you go back one, one more slide there. Um, yeah, as we're seeing a lot more 3D I sails out on the race course, and you know the sails are amazing the way you can repair them. I've done some crazy repairs with. Uh, you see, it's a Loctite repair glue, 
And then the material on the left is the 3DI5 ply, which is a material we make that's pre-made uh, essentially to, to do these repairs offshore and, and quickly. We use it here too in repairing the sails. And it's, it's amazing what you can do with the glue and that uh, 3DI5 ply. So, you know, as, as you have boats with nice 3DI sails, having some of that, uh, it's a two part of glue that goes with a little gun and it goes off and you just would put it on and you do your best you can to put some weight and compression on it. And, um, but you could make a working sail that broke pretty badly. You know, we don't see it very often, but if it went through something or, you know, spreader or whatever, you could definitely do a big repair out at sea that you were not able to do, um, you know, five, 10 years ago, even by using the glue and the five ply to put a sail back together. It's, it's pretty amazing what you can do. You have personal experience in that? I actually have way <laughs> too much personal experience in that. Yes. <laughs> great. Great. So if you guys want to know about that, call Patrick. So, <laughs> um, well, guys, this has been great. We got one more part, uh, kind of end of April, early May. Um, you know, you'll see it on our social and, uh, if you have any questions, here's all of our contact information. This will, this, uh, if you missed us, uh, sorry, we missed you, but it will be live on YouTube. Oh, starting tomorrow. Um, and so if you have crew, friends, people who are interested in offshore sailing, this is a great opportunity to, uh, learn some more and pass it around to your team. So guys, with that being said, thank you so much. Thanks for everybody for tuning in and, uh, we will see you next time. Thanks, Alex. All right. Thank you.